today because how do we tell stories nowadays? Where do you where where do people tell stories? Oh, yes. On the internet. On the internet. Where else do we tell stories? On books. In books. The printing press was a marvelous invention. Yes. And a sleepover. Oh, I like that. And a sleepover. And you know what? That's before the internet, before radio, before TV, before the printing press. How did we share our stories? The campfire. The campfire, the sleepover, at the dinner table. People share their history, their family experience with each other by word of mouth. Our speaker today is here to share her family story with us, to tell the story of survival, of luck, of people who helped because they wanted to help. People who stood up. Okay? So our speaker today is Heidi Fishman, and she's both an author and a psychologist, and is on the board of the Vermont Holocaust Memorial. She speaks to schools and community groups in order to teach about the perils of prejudice and bigotry and to teach people the importance of finding commonality with others. She grew up knowing that her mother and grandparents were Holocaust survivors. And in 2012, she started to piece together her story. Five years, their story, and five years of investigation led to her book, to Thomas. And which has, um, was, designated by the National Council for the Social Studies and the Children's Book Council as a notable trade book for young people. She lives in Norwich, Vermont, so she's come a ways to be with us today, and for which I'm very grateful, with her husband and her ager border carrier. When she was staying at home due to COVID safety measures, she likes to travel and discover new places and meet new people. So today she gets to meet you and meet our school and share her story. Thank you. Welcome. So I want to tell you all, actually, if you can't hear me, just somebody like raise your hand and make, make noise if I'm not speaking loud enough. Let me tell you that when I was in middle school, I absolutely hated history class. And I avoided reading anything extra that I didn't have to read. I thought history was a waste of time. It had already happened. It had no bearing on my life. I wanted to know science because that was about the future. That was my life was going to be what was to be discovered. I thought history was a waste. And one day in history class, I raised my hand and I asked the teacher, why are we studying all this stuff that already happened? And it was the worst answer I ever got from a teacher. His answer was, Heidi, you'll figure it out one day. I'm hoping that this story will let you guys figure out the answer to, this, to my question before you're an adult, okay? Because it took well into my adult years to figure it out. So I want you to listen to this story and ask yourself, why does history matter? My mom was born in 1935. They lived in Cologne, Germany. The family is Jewish. Her name was Ruth Lichtenstern, but everybody called her Tootie. In 1936, Hitler comes to power in Germany, and the Nazis are rising, and it's dangerous to be Jewish in Germany. So the family moved from Germany to Amsterdam in the Netherlands. It's just a three-hour drive, that little black arrow on the map. It was an easy move for the most part because my grandfather was able to move with his job. His boss moved the whole company to Amsterdam. They had a place to live. They had enough money. It was not a difficult move for them. It was difficult for a lot of people, but not for them. The hardest part was that Germany had a tax it was nicknamed a flight tax, but they called it the Reich tax. 
in order to leave the country at the time that they left, they had to leave 65% of everything they owned in Germany. Not 65% of their income, 65% of their possessions, of their money, of the value of their furniture, of the value of anything that they had. My great-grandfather, Louis Speer, who's in this picture, tried to take more than the 65, tried to take more with him than he was allowed, and he was put in jail for six months for it. That was the hardest part of the move. Things were okay. They were in Amsterdam. There's my mom, Tootie. Her little brother, Robbie, was born in 1938. This picture is from 1940. I think they're very cute kids. Heinz and Margaret, my grandparents. And then Tootie's, grand, Tootie's grandparents, Flo and Louis Speer, Jenny and Oscar Lichtenstern. They all moved. Things went pretty well. They were able to stay together in the same town, live fairly close to each other, get together for family events, for parties, for celebrations. And then in 1940, in May, the Germans invaded the Netherlands. They thought the Netherlands would be safe because it was a country that remained neutral during World War I. But World War II, they thought it would stay that way. But Hitler said, I don't care. I want Germany to invade, and they did. This is a picture of Dutch citizens welcoming in the German troops with the Hitler salute. So now for a, German, for a Jewish family in Amsterdam, it suddenly was not so safe. One, because the Germans are there, but two, because you don't know which one of your neighbors you can trust anymore. And then the Germans started putting in anti-Jewish laws. And they were very slow changes. It was not that one day life changed. It was very, very slow and sneaky. If you, were, if you owned a radio, you had to register it, or a bike, or a car, you had to register it. Then a few months later, oh, you're Jewish and you have a bike? You're not allowed to. We're going to confiscate that. You're Jewish and you have a car? We're going to take that away. You're Jewish, you have a radio? We're going to take that away. A month later, you're Jewish, oh, you can't use public transportation. If you're going to go to a store and you're Jewish, you can only shop in a store owned by Jews. If you need to go to the doctor, you can only go to a Jewish doctor. If you are a Jewish doctor, you can only see Jewish patients. You want to go to the theater? Sorry, not allowed. Public park? Nope. Swimming pool? Nope. Museum? No. Is every month there'd be like a new rule. Public education, you're Jewish? Nope. Can't go to public school anymore. They just kept throwing more rules in. And then there was a rule that you had a curfew. At 8 p.m. you had to be home, and you can't leave your home until 6 a.m. in the morning. You need to be in your own house. So they would know where you are at, at, if they wanted you, basically. And these rules just kept piling up was getting more and more dangerous. So these are pictures of, of what, how life was changing. The top, that boy is sitting on a bench that says, only for Aryans. Aryan means German white, not Jewish. The upper corner on the right there is that says the Jewish quarter. If you were Jewish, you couldn't live in any neighborhood you wanted to in Amsterdam. You had to live in this neighborhood. The bottom, that says for Jews forbidden. There were places where Jews just were not allowed to be. And then this bottom corner here, somebody graffitied J-O-O-D on the door of a store. J-O-O-D means Jew. So they were tagging that store, saying that's, where, that's a Jewish store, don't shop there. Hitler's rules were segregating the society. He did not think up this system. He got this system from the United States. Blacks in the back of the bus, different educational systems for black and white children, different 
water fountains for black and white children. He was basing segregation in Europe for the Jews on what he saw happening in the United States already. This man is very important in my mom's story. His name is Eckbert de Young. He worked with my grandfather. He was the Reichs Minister for Non-Ferrous Metals for the Netherlands. It's a very, very long name of his job, but basically he was a business associate of my grandfather. He was not Jewish. What my grandfather did in 1941 was he took all of his money that he had left and he gave it to Egbert. He said, the Germans came after my money in Germany. They came after my money when I left Germany. They'll come after it again. You keep it. Put it in your bank account. I trust you. If you can use it to help us at some point, go ahead and use it. But hang on to it. When the war's over, I'll come back and get it. Egbert took the money. We'll come back to the money in a minute. This is my grandmother's identification card. Everybody had an ID. See the J next to her, her picture there? If you were Jewish, they just put a J right on there. So if you were stopped by the police for some reason, stopped by a soldier for some reason, they looked at your ID, they knew you were Jewish, you got different treatment than if you were not Jewish. And then this is my mother's ID card on this side. She didn't have one with the picture and everything because she was just a kid. She was five years old. Five years old. The bottom word there that I circled, it says fear. It's the, it's the number four. And the question in front of it is how many of your grandparents are Jewish? And for my mom, the answer was four. If you were, if the answer was two, then you were only considered a half Jew. If the answer is one, you're a quarter Jew. You were Jewish by your race, by who your parents and your grandparents were. Not by whether or not you went to synagogue every week. Not by whether you honored the Sabbath. Not by whether you ate challah and ate matzah and lit candles or whatever else you, you might know about being Jewish. It was not about what your belief system was. It was about how you were born. The more Jewish you were in the Germans' eyes, the worse the situation was for you. I circled my mom's picture there. This is her first grade class. I assume here in the fall, maybe when it's not COVID, everybody gets together and you get the class photo. This is the class photo. First grade. One teacher, if you look closely, every single child is wearing the yellow star. The J-O-O-D looks like it's in Hebrew letters, but it's not. It's just calligraphy that looks like Hebrew, but it's the word Jew in Dutch. You are being, you had to wear your, your star to show that you were Jewish because you had different rules you had to follow because you were Jewish. You were not allowed to go to public school, so the Jewish community made their own school. That's 40 or 50 kids with one teacher. I just want you to think about if when you were in first grade, you had 40 or 50 kids and one teacher, how much you might learn that year. Because I know I probably didn't, wouldn't have learned that much. I would have been talking to my friends in the back of the class, and the teacher would not have been able to keep order with that many kids. Only a handful of these children survive the war. I want you to remember that as I'm telling these stories. Most of them were killed. My mom tells a story about seeing something called a razzia. I need to explain that. Razzia means roundup. I went to the place where this happened. This is the apartment building they were told they had to live in when they were no longer allowed to live in the neighborhood they originally lived in because they were Jewish. This is the view out the window in the middle there. That's the view out the window of her apartment. I went there, I knocked on the door, and I asked the people who lived there if I could see their apartment, and they let me in. And that's the view of what she might have been looking at out the window one day. 
So it's a long city block. The Germans would come and park one truck at one end, another truck at the other end. They had their guns, they had their dogs. They had certain addresses they were targeting. Jews, out, 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 you're coming with us. They'd round people up, put them in their truck, and take them away just because they were Jewish for no other reason. They didn't do anything wrong. My mom remembers watching that. She stood at the window with a doll that had bright pink clothes on. And somebody behind her, she doesn't remember who it was, grabbed her, pulled her away from the window and started yelling at her. Don't stand at the window with that pink doll. The soldiers might notice you. We don't want to be noticed. If we're not noticed, maybe they'll forget about us. She said just the whole time, living at that time, whether you were in town, whether you were playing with your friends on the sidewalk, you wanted to not be noticed. These roundups were happening more and more. And so the family went into hiding. Raise your hand if you know who Anne Frank is, or if you've read her book or heard anything about her. About half of you, maybe more, OK. Anne Frank was, was pretty famous. She went into hiding in Amsterdam with her family. She wrote her diary while she was in hiding. That was a hiding situation that was very well planned. Her father planned that for months. They had a secret wall that they were behind at an apartment. There was food stockpiled. My grandfather made a decision to go into hiding with the family, but it was like a very quick decision in the course of one or two days. He had a friend named Bobby Klopfer who said, yes, you can hide in my attic room. This is the room. I found it. The whole family, Heinz, Margaret, Tootie, and Robbie were in this room for about a month. They were not allowed near the window. There was probably a good blackout curtain because they, be, they didn't want to be seen from the street. This is the fourth floor of the building. The Klopfers lived on the second floor. Another family lived on the third floor. So they had to be very, very quiet so that the family in between wouldn't hear them. Bobby Klopfer had to bring them food because they couldn't leave the room to go to a store to get food. They couldn't cook anything in this room. There was a bathroom down the hall. They could go use the bathroom when they knew that nobody was home on the second floor, I mean, on the third floor, that would hear the flushing. Tootie was seven, Robbie was five. And I just want you to think about being with your five-year-old little brother who was full of energy and was a real troublemaker and having to be quiet 24 hours a day and you can't leave and what that might be like as a child. Be quiet. Our lives depend on it for a month. My grandfather was getting really scared. He said, if we're caught here, they're going to shoot us. And they'll, the Klopfers will be in trouble, too, because they're the ones who are hiding us. I don't want that responsibility. And that's when Eckbert came through. Eckbert was able to get this piece of paper to my grandfather. All right, that's all in French. In the name of the Republic of Paraguay, from the consul in Bern, we're saying that Heinz Lichtenstern and his wife, Margaret, and their two children are citizens of Paraguay. Somebody tell me where Paraguay is. South America. Okay. Oh, we didn't want the teachers to answer. <laughs> okay, South America. Paraguay was not part of World War II. They were a neutral country. The Nazis didn't need a country that they were not at war with to now join the war if they were going to start harming their citizens. This was a passport for the four people in the family. It's a little different than the passports that exist now. Now you have a passport for one person. This was a passport for a family. It said they were Paraguayan. And I want to point out that 
I found this out only a couple years ago, actually after I wrote, after I published Cody's Promise, like way after, that the passport was produced by Polish diplomats in Switzerland who were working with Jews that were both right-wing and left-wing political party members, and they all worked together, very disparate people that would normally never even talk to each other, to create these papers to give to Jews who were in peril to help them. So they crossed their political um, divide in order to help people. So my grandfather has his paper. He says, we're Paraguayan now. Let's turn ourselves in. They won't hurt us. And that's what he did. They left their hiding place. They turned themselves in. And it backfired. It did not work. First, they were sent to this building, which was the Jewish theater, which was the one theater in Amsterdam where they let Jews perform and Jews go watch shows. And they used that as a holding cell. Hundreds of people in the theater, not the lobby part where the windows are, but in the back where the stage is and where the audience would sit. My mom remembers being there for about three days. She remembers that the family, there was no chairs. They had pulled them all out. They were sitting on the floor. They were not given food. They were not given water. There were a couple bathrooms, like you would imagine in a theater. But you know, there's always a line at intermission at the theater because there's never enough bathrooms. Imagine uh, hundreds of people living there for a few days and not enough bathrooms. And everybody was scared. The adults were scared. The kids were scared. Nobody knew what was going to happen next. And then what happened next is they were sent to this camp called Westerbork. Westerbork was a refugee camp that the Dutch built on the border with Germany because there were so many Jews that were leaving Germany at the beginning. They didn't want them coming into their country. They built a camp, a refugee camp at their border. And then when the Germans found the camp, they put barbed wire around it, and now it was a prison. And all the Jews that they were finding throughout, the, throughout Holland, they were sending them there. The train would come in from this side, from the west, drop people off. And then once a week, on a Monday, they'd announce who was going to be sent further east, sometimes with 1,000 people, sometimes 2,000 people. And on Tuesday morning, the train would leave and go east to another camp, just d dividing up families, picking people. It never, nobody really knew why, who was sent when. So Monday nights were always very anxious, and then Tuesdays people would be sent off. This is a picture of the main road in Westerbork. You see how many, um, th this is the train right here that just came in. People had just gotten off the train, and those are all barracks. I'm gonna... No, we'll go here. My grandfather's job was he was a metals commodities dealer. It meant he bought and sold metal internationally. The Germans needed metal. If you're going to fight a war, you need metal for guns, for tanks, for submarines. And they, my grandfather helped turn Westerbork into a metal sorting facility. They'd bring scrap metal from all over the country, or an airplane was shot down. And the Jews were put to work chopping it up and separating the different kinds of metal. It started out where about five people were working, and later on there were about 1,200 people working. It was 1,200 Jews separating metal, helping the Germans. Raise your hand. Why would my grandfather do that? Because he didn't want to die. Okay. More specific, why would he do that? Say it. Because he was useful, exactly. Okay, he was being useful to the Germans and he was helping 1,200 Jews be useful. 1,200 people that wouldn't be killed because they were considered useful. My grandfather's friend Eckbert, who was in charge of all metal deals that were going on in the country, he got in touch with the resistance. 
and that metal that was being separated, they let the resistance take it. It would get mixed up again and brought back to the camp. And then the Jews would be put to work separating the same pile again. So they were looking very busy, but they were not accomplishing anything. It's kind of like what I used to do in study hall. Try to look busy so that you're kept alive, but don't accomplish anything and give the Germans what they need. So they were doing this in the camp. While they were doing this, this piece of paper here, which I found in an archive, my mother doesn't remember that this happened. The Lichtenstern family was released from Westerbork. They were sent back to Amsterdam. So my grandfather could keep arranging the metal deals for the metal to get come in and out of the camp. So the family, they were. They were kept alive. They went back to town. They were probably the only Jews in town at that point. That worked for a while. Look at, the, look at the metal in that pile. It was a metal camp. That worked for a few months. And then in February of 1944, I found this document here. The Lick, Heinz Lichtenstern and two other men were being arrested, even though they were what the Germans called metal Jews. They were going to be arrested because a man named Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann, did not want any more Jews left in the Netherlands. He was trying to get all the Jews rounded up and sent to the camps in the East. That was his job for Hitler. And he was in charge of that. And he was trying to, he knew that these few men were left in Amsterdam with their families. And he sent this letter out, arrest them. There's some Hebrew writing at the bottom in this little stamp in the bottom. This piece of paper was used as evidence against Eichmann when he was put on trial in 1960. So it's, if you ever want to look up and find out more about the Holocaust, you look up Eichmann. He, he was just a notoriously awful man. So the family was arrested again and sent back to Westerbork. But my grandfather kept being sent to Amsterdam to do these metal deals. So he'd be five days in the camp, two days in Amsterdam, back to the camp, back to Amsterdam, back and forth. And in July was my mother's ninth birthday. And he managed, when he was in Amsterdam, to buy this doll. And he brought it to my mom. And my grandmother made a cake. It wasn't a real cake. It was made out of rotten potatoes, because that's all they had. They didn't really have real food. She made a cake out of rotten potatoes. And they had a birthday party. And she got a doll for her birthday. Probably one of the very few kids who got a birthday, a real birthday present with a toy from a store while in a concentration camp. But it wasn't just a doll. When my grandfather gave it to her, he took, he showed her that the head was hollow. And he showed her that he hid money inside it. And what he said was, this is the only money we have left. We don't have anything else of value here at Westerbork. You are in charge of it. If we have to bribe someone, if we need extra food, if, we're, if our lives are in danger and I want to give some money, money to someone to save our lives, you have it in the doll. This is your responsibility. Nine years old. And it was a good thing that, that's a picture of my mom when she was nine. It's a good thing he did that because a few months later in September, the family's put into one of these type of cattle cars 80 to 100 people in a cattle car and sent to another camp. They were sent to a camp in what was then called Czechoslovakia. It was approximately a three-day journey. Not given any food, only the food that you managed to take with you. The train car had a barrel in the middle of it, which was the toilet. If you needed to go, Go ahead, use the barrel in front of everybody else. That was the only sanitation that they had. Three days. No seats. This is just an empty box car that you would normally put 
cows or horses in. They arrived in Trezenstadt in the Czech Republic. This is a model of the camp. It was a fortress city that was built in the medieval times to keep invading armies out. And the Nazis found it and said, oh, there's walls around the city. We can keep Jews in. So it became a camp. And when I say camp, I am not talking like summer camp. This is not Boy Scout camp, Girl Scout camp, summer camp like we know around here. Of the thousands of Jews that were transferred to Trezenstadt, most were deported to points further east and almost certain death. But 33,000 people died in the camp from the conditions. It was cold. They didn't have the right clothing. They weren't given enough food. They were starving. There were lice. There were rats. There were bed bugs. There was no medicine. It was really horrible conditions. When they were there for about a month, this notice came out. It's German. It's not printed well. Don't try to read it. I'm sure nobody here knows German. Um, actually, I shouldn't say that. Maybe somebody knows German. But um, This statement says that tomorrow there will be a transport with 2,500 men on it. They will be between the ages of 16 and 55. Here's the list that's attached to it. There will be no exception. If you're on the list, you're going tomorrow onto a transport, which is taking you further east to another camp. Nobody really knew what the east was at that point. They didn't know exactly where east was. But they knew once people were sent to the east, they never were heard from again. They knew they were being killed. My grandfather was on that list. And my mom tells the story that she remembers him coming and saying goodbye to the family and just hugging her and crying. So just imagine your father coming to you saying, I need to leave tomorrow. I'm going to be killed. Be good. Take care of your brother. And then when he went the next day to get on that train, somebody reminded him, don't you have a passport? And he was like, well, it doesn't work. It didn't keep me out of Westerbork. It didn't keep me out of Tracer's shot. What? It doesn't matter that I have a passport. It's not worth the paper it's printed on. Well, try it. Just try it. It can't hurt. So he tried it. He showed someone the passport. And he was given this little pink piece of paper. My grandmother kept that paper her entire life. I have that piece of paper. It says Ausgeschieden, which means withdrawn. My grandfather did not go to a place called Auschwitz that day. Auschwitz was where the worst murdering was going on. He did not go on the train that day because he had a passport that said he was Paraguayan. The Nazis, over the next month, had 11 transports with, I think, 17,000 people from Trezenstadt to Auschwitz. The first few were the men. The next few were the, their wives. The next few were their children. It was basically, oh, we're going to, you know, your, your husband went, we're going to send you now so you can be with your husband. Oh, children, you got left behind. You should go with your parents. And they were sending them all to Auschwitz and murdering them. I am, I am convinced that my family lived because of that piece of paper. They spent the next several months in Trezenstadt. I want to tell you three stories about life in Trezenstadt. First one down here, this picture of the washroom. It, it's from a, a survivor, who, a child who was there drew that picture when she was 12. I don't, Actually, I did talk to her once because I got permission to use her picture. And I imagine it. It's not actually my grandmother, but I imagine the lady in the blue dress being my grandmother. And then the two kids are Robbie and Tootie. There were three or four sinks for 80 to 90 people that lived in the barracks. 
There were no showers. In order to stay clean, there was always a line at the sinks. And my grandmother's strategy here was to wake the kids up at 3 o'clock in the morning, in the middle of the night, make them wash when there was no line, and then they could go back to bed. It was cold water. It was winter. There was no heat in the building. But her philosophy was, if we stay clean, we won't get sick. We won't get infections from these lice bites and these flea bites and bed bugs and stuff. We need to stay clean so we don't get sick, so we can survive this. The next picture on the bottom there is a bunch of people waiting in line for the food. My mom was given the job by her mother to go get the food every day. She had like this bucket, an old cooking pot of some sort. And she said she'd have to wait in line. And the food was pretty much a small loaf of stale, moldy bread and some soup that was made with like potato peels and rotten vegetables, mostly water not much nutrition. And she remembers it very clearly because sometimes she'd be walking back to the barracks and she'd spill the soup on her coat. And by the end of the war, her coat was just completely stained with this spilled soup. They were not given enough food. Top corner, that's my grandfather from before the war wearing his ski pants. He's on a ski vacation. Notice the style of the pants. They're tight at the ankles, and then they're all balloony further up. My grandfather had a job at the camp working in the root cellar. The root cellar is like an underground place where they would store fruits and vegetables to keep them a little bit colder than if you kept them up above, or to keep them a little bit warmer so they wouldn't freeze in the winter. And the Nazis, that's where they kept all the food. But they had people sorting it, because you don't want one rotten potato in the much with all the others, because then it get, they all get mushy. So his job was to separate them, because the Germans got the good food, the Jews got the bad food. Well, it turns out that there was a particular guard that was there when my grandfather was there. And every once in a while, he would look at my grandfather and say, I'm going to go take a break, something to that effect. You're on your own. I'll be back in 15 minutes. And my grandfather would take the food and shove it in his pants, and then he could bring it to my grandmother and, and the kids and give them extra food. I found out that the reason why this man did that was that before the war, my grandfather was an international businessman. He used to stay at a particular hotel in Berlin, Germany, and he used to stay at, like, like get good service at the restaurant. And he always tipped the head waiter very well, because he wanted good service and he wanted a good table. Turns out that head waiter was the guard at the root cellar. So my grandfather had known him before the war and had been giving him good tips. And it paid off because he got food later. In May of 1945, the war was finally over, five years after it had started for the family. Just before my mom's 10th birthday, and actually on Robbie's seventh birthday, the camp was liberated by the Russians. This is the Russians coming in and being welcomed into the camp. It took two months for the family to get home. There was a typhus epidemic. They didn't want people traveling and spreading disease around, the, around Europe. And there were just millions of people that were displaced. There were so many people in not where they wanted to be because of what had happened with this war. So it took two months for them to get home. This is a picture of an American soldier. His name is Lloyd Miller. I'm kind of searching for his family. Um, my mom had a total crush on this guy when she was 10 years old. Um, but he was the first person who treated the family well after they had been through what they'd been through. He, he, he took them under their, his wing for a couple days, and he gave the kids chewing gum that they never, ever had before. And he showed them cartoons that they had some like base camp where they were welcomed for a while. 
and he talked a lot to my grandparents and told them what was going on in the world and everything. The family finally got back to Amsterdam in June. And before the war, again, before things got terrible, my grandfather, like he had given money to Egbert, he gave some other possessions to another friend. My grandmother's fur coat and the silver and whatever, the china, just things that they wanted to try to keep. He gave it to this other friend. When they got back to Amsterdam, they, they went to his house. They knocked on the door and said, we survived. Against all odds, we survived. We have nowhere to go. Can we stay with you? The man said, no. I'm busy. We were told the Jews would not return. Leave me alone. Stole his item, just stole his stuff and slammed the door in my grandfather's face, so to speak. So that was someone who he thought was a friend. The family did okay. Things, they got back on their feet. They stayed in Amsterdam for a few years. In 1950, they moved to Brazil. In 1953, they finally came to the United States. My mom became a naturalized citizen. She's got children, she's got grandchildren. There's mom with her doll telling her story a few years ago. There's mom and I doing another talk, another, a, a different time. These numbers are important. Of the nine million Jews in Europe before the war, six million were murdered. 1.5 million were children that were murdered just because they were born to Jewish parents and Jewish grandparents. Of the 140,000 Jews in the Netherlands, 107,000 were murdered. The numbers are staggering. I just want to read the yellow box here. Of the 15,000 children in Traisenstadt, only 132 are known to have survived. My mom and my uncle are two of them. The statistics are such that they shouldn't have made it. The fact that they made it is incredible. I should not be alive. Hitler did not only target the Jews. If you were Polish, he tried to kill you. If you were gay or lesbian, he tried to kill you. If you were alcoholic, you, you were in danger. If you were black, if you were homeless, if you had any kind of disability, if you were blind or deaf or had an emotional problem, you were a target. He killed six million Jews, but five million other people of these other groups. All right, why is history important? Why am I bothering? So it doesn't repeat itself. So it doesn't repeat itself. Anybody else have any other answers to that question? So we can learn from other people's mistakes. So we can learn from other people's mistakes, yes, absolutely. Anybody else have any ideas why I'm bothering? Why do I drive two hours to come tell you this story? I couldn't understand the last part you said. So you came here to explain what happened in your mother's life and her mother's. All right, so if we understand what happened to people, we might really try not to let it happen again. Did you, no? Okay, one more. 
so we have a better understanding. The people who were doing these terrible things didn't have to do these terrible things, but they were indoctrinated into it. There was a lot of propaganda. They were taught in Germany. The children were taught that all the problems that were happening in their country, there, there was economic problems, were because of the Jews, that the Jews caused all the trouble. They were taught to hate. Don't let anybody tell you to hate or dislike or bully another person or group that is different than you. Differences are good. We don't have to be afraid of differences and we shouldn't hate differences. When you are in history class, you're not just learning about things that happened in other countries far away by the leaders of those countries. It happened to people. It happened to children. It happened to mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. The stories you learn in history actually happened to real people. They lived through these things. A famous rabbi said, the Holocaust didn't start with the gas chambers. The gas chambers is how they killed most of the people. It started with words. If you look at this pyramid, this is called the pyramid of hate. If you are willing to take on any of the things in the blue level at the bottom, if you use non-inclusive language, if you fear people who are different, if you accept that people who are different are bad or wrong for some reason, it's easier to then go to the next level and do things that are nasty. It's easier to bully someone if you believe that they are different and somehow less than you. And once you're bullying them and being nasty, well, it's easier to accept discrimination on a, on a legal level. And it's easier to go higher and higher into these worse things. So don't get sucked in at the bottom. How people acted in the past created the world we have now. How we act now determines our future. These kind of genocides, like happened to the Jews in, in the 1940s in Europe, are still happening in the world to different people. There is still a lot of discrimination. Do what you can to not be a part of it in any way you can. Try to fight it. And I got time for questions. I know it's a lot of information I threw at you. Little questions, big questions, I don't care. Really loud so I can hear you because there's this buzzing happening over here. Why can't the children um, make their own decisions not based on um, their parents? Can't they just say, oh, I'm actually a Christian? Well, even if you did, the Nazis didn't care. They didn't care what you believed in. They cared who, what your bloodline was. That's like saying to somebody, who is Hispanic or black or Native American for them to say, oh, I'm not Native American anymore. I'll just be white. It doesn't really work. Now, there were children, there were families that had children that gave their children away to Christian families and said, take care of my child. Pretend he's yours. Pretend she's yours. Maybe she'll survive that way. There are plenty of families that did that. But it was a pretend. Get a fake birth certificate, take on a different name. A 
I can't believe there's no questions. I can keep talking if you don't have questions. I got lots to say on the topic. Okay, good question. I'm going to first tell you why they moved to Brazil. Okay, so the first thing was they were in Amsterdam and everything was going fine. And then the Korean War started. And my grandfather was afraid that just like the Germans took a war and brought it to the Netherlands, he was afraid that the Korean War would work its way all the way across Europe and end up in the Netherlands. We said, we're out of here. And they went to Brazil because it was sort of it was a country you could bribe yourself into, all right? Sort of trying to get into different places and being a refugee. He, could, he found a way to get himself into Brazil. It was hard to, to, to move. It's hard to be a refugee. Why did he move to the United States? Again, the United States is considered the land of opportunity. You know, it's freedom, freedom of religion. They thought this would be the best place to be. They couldn't move to the United States in 1950, which is where they wanted to go because of the way our legal system was. But in 19, we had a quota system that you could only have so many immigrants from different countries. And my grandfather was from Eastern Germany, which was near Poland. And it was a part of the, it was German when he was born, but it was Poland after the war. So he was considered Polish. And the Polish quota was oversubscribed. In 1953, the United States changed their laws and said, it don't have to go by the husband's nationality, you can go by the wife's nationality. And my grandmother was from Western Germany, so she was in the German quota, and that was not oversubscribed. So they were able to immigrate as Germans when they weren't able to immigrate as Poles, even though my grandfather never thought himself as Polish because it was a change after he was not there anymore. It's very complicated. <laughs> Tell them about my book. Sure. So I wrote the book about my mom, Teddy's Promise. Um, it's it's got a lot of documents in it, so it kind of is a little bit of a history teaching book, but it's more like a novel. It's a lot of, it's just a story. Um, it took me five years of research to come up with all the information to make it work. You can get it on Amazon. Hopefully, you can get it from the library at the school soon. <laughs> um, there's an audible version if you like to listen rather than read. And um, yeah, it's gotten some awards, so. When you were growing up, did you hear more stories from your grandparents or from your mother? When I was growing up, I didn't hear a lot of stories. It was like we knew. It was like, OK, mom survived. My grandparents survived. My uncle survived. We just knew it. If I asked a question, I always got an answer. But the, there weren't like voluntary stories. And once you got the answer, then the, the subject got changed. You know, it was like a, a question, OK, we answer it. And then we're on to something else, because we don't want to stay there. It was kind of avoided, but not avoided to the point where I was afraid to ask a question. Um, what were you born? Was it like Brazil? Or I was born in Connecticut. I was born in Connecticut, and I moved up to Vermont pretty much as soon as I was an adult, so. <laughs> yep. Uh, what do you believe in? What do I believe in? Yeah. As far as religion? Yeah. Um, that's a really hard question. I mean, I consider myself Jewish, but I consider myself more Jewish as a culturally, but not so much about God kind of thing, yeah. if that makes sense. But I, my son is an Orthodox Jew who lives in New York City who very much believes all of it. You know, so, and my mother doesn't believe in God at all, and I'm somewhere in the middle. We just, you know, 
we try to just get along with each other. It doesn't really, it, beliefs I feel are very personal and nobody's really wrong because a belief is a belief. That's where I am. <laughs> Basically, I never went to Sunday school as a kid because my dad kept bringing us up to Stowe to go skiing. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> so the other class had a lot more questions than you guys do. And I just can't believe it that there aren't any. What were some of the questions the other class had? What <laughs> the questions the other class had? I don't know. So somebody asked what would have happened if Hitler won the war? I didn't really have an answer for that other than the world would have been a very different place than what it is right now. Um, what if we were only living under fascism, which is what that, that was the, what the Nazis believed in. You don't have much freedom. What was Tootie's promise? I didn't answer that question. What was Tootie's promise? You've got to read the book for that. My publisher would be very <laughs> mad if I answered that. <laughs> All right, what are, some, what are some of the feelings that you have right now? I can't hear you at all. Very overwhelmed. Very overwhelmed. It's hard to ask questions when you're overwhelmed. Overwhelmed because of the statistics, of the random things that I told you about, some of the stories. Just the story. The story. The whole story is overwhelming. It is. Up at the very top. Okay, understanding in more depth. I like that. Here. Interested. Interested. It's a very interesting. I mean, the whole thing is very interesting on a very on lots of different levels. You know, why would this person make this decision, and why did this person make that decision? Um, when I was writing the book, and I kept trying to get into my grandfather's head or my grandmother's head, and why would they do this now? And what would they say in this situation? It's, it's, it is interesting in a very sad way. Um, I feel surprised that um, your mother went through that and your grandma and also I feel like you want to read the book. Oh, I'm glad you want to read the book. Or, you know what, whether you read this book or any other book about this time period, what was happening, it's, it's important to understand what people can do to each other when they lose empathy. Empathy is when you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes. What if you were living their life? What if you were in their situation? If you don't have empathy, this kind of thing happens. Um, and just remember that. Just try to remember somebody else is going through something. Somebody else might be different than you. That's OK. That's actually really good. If we were all the same, then we might end up with every single person in the world wanting to open their own restaurant and nobody learning how to do a computer and make it fix it when it's broken. And we'd have a lot of food, but we wouldn't have any technology. Or we'd have everybody wanting to be a soccer coach and nobody ever wanting to play baseball. It gets boring if everybody's the same. Differences are good. <laughs> I'm smiling under here. I'm trying to, I'm using my smile to get, and then I realize you're not, you can't see it. <laughs> Yep, thanks for listening. And if questions come later, your teachers can help. And if the teachers don't have answers, they can email me and I can try to help. <laughs>